Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith. I'm your host today, and I'm the founder of Impact Equity as well. Our goal here is simply to educate and inspire the passive investor as they start their journey or they continue their journey from traditional investments over to passive investing in real estate through the syndication model. So we have just an amazing guest here today, Ryan Stieg. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Randy. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Outstanding. Well, um, why don't we just go ahead and jump right in if you want to walk us through, if you can, your journey to passive investing. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try to skip some of the commercials uh, on, the, on the long spots in there, but um, I'll say I, I started with uh, my, my father was an entrepreneur, uh, had started his own business. And so I had entrepreneurialism in, in my background. And, uh, and he also, through those businesses, owned the real estate that those businesses operated in. But as a kid, I didn't connect the dots. And, but I knew that that was, that was his background. Um, in college, I picked up a purple book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. And, Sure, a couple of listeners have heard of that book. Oh um, yes, but uh, and I, I started to work with a local real estate investor in Phoenix, where I was going to school. But after college, the bills come, real life hits. So I went and got a job, and and I kind of set aside a passion for real estate investing, uh, and that that carried on for a, a while. My wife and I moved back to where we're from, and I got into the family business, um, and. In that step, moving from Phoenix back back home to Montana, uh, we we were at the bottom of the real estate market in Phoenix, and so we kept our property and became accidental landlords. And so we held on to that property for a while. I got comfortable working with a, a property manager remotely, and we just held that property, still not actively investing in real estate. Um, until about 2016, I, I started to get that bug again for how can I do something other than the stock market? I wanted to get back into real estate. And so uh, through a series of podcasts, I heard about turnkey properties and I thought that was my route. So I took out some of our savings and uh, HELOC on, the, on, our, on our primary residence. And we went and started uh, accumulating putting down payments and taking loans out to accumulate a, a small portfolio of turnkey properties throughout the country. And okay. got to a certain point where I thought, this is a lot of work, even managing a, a property manager, you know, I'm paying them uh, to manage the property and they're all doing a great job, but it's still a lot of work to keep up as you, as you start to accumulate a handful of properties. And so when I looked at the scale that I would need to scale to, to accumulate the number of properties I wanted to replace my income didn't seem feasible anymore. And so, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, how many, how many homes did you accumulate over those years that you were doing the turnkey model? Uh, at, at the highest point, uh, we had seven properties and 10 doors. Um, okay. And so it was at about five or six where I started to look at the math of, you know, I'm going to have to go get to this many properties and I'm already doing a lot of work on top of a W2 to, to manage these properties. So through podcasts, which is where a lot of things get discovered that you might not otherwise know about, um, I heard about real estate syndications. Okay. And so uh, as you know, uh, kind of the triangle of investing is you either put in time or money or experience or some combination thereof. And so uh, with Time being a, lot, a limited resource for me, and not having direct experience as as a you know, hammer and nails uh, type house flipper, I thought, well, if I can continue to save money and invest it proactively, I can contribute time, or I can tr contribute the money and outsource the time and expertise to someone else. And that's where yeah. passive real estate just through syndications just seemed like the magic bullet for for what I need 
than what I was looking for. Yeah, I, I like that you talk about that triangle. And it's you and I have a very, very similar path. I did turnkeys out of state. I got up to five doors or five houses and, and had the same experience. But I love that you talked about that triangle, time, money, or experience. And I think a lot of us come into this thinking that we need all three of those. And that's the intimidating factor that keeps a lot of us from taking that first uh, step towards moving forward, even, even in the single family phase, space for that matter, right? So I, I'm curious, you, you did what so many folks do where they start with single families, the accidental landlord, which you, you hear that time and time again, but then at some point um, you do the math and you start thinking, man, I'm going to need 50 or 100 or whatever number doors to actually step away from my W-2. And then the light comes on that maybe I can do this multifamily space. So do you think if, if you were to, if you had it to all do over again, would you have started where you did and do single family, or do you think you would have jumped into multifamily sooner? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I one thing I really like about the single family or small multifamily, so one to four units, uh, mm -hmm. is, was what I invested in is I love the time erosion of of 30 year fixed rate debt. So that's one thing that I, I really do like. And so I've, I still have, uh, I've only sold one of the properties. And so I still have six and I love having that, that fixed rate debt at what used to be, <laughs> what used to be lower rates, uh, yeah. but that 30 year fixed rate debt. So we'll hold on to those properties until the time presents where, where it's a good to sell them. But uh, other than having that 30 year fixed rate debt, yes, I, I would have started with, with passive syndications. But um, I think for a lot of people, similar to you and other people that we meet in this space, um, it's valuable to have that background and experience one way or another before you get into syndications uh, to kind of appreciate what the operator is doing and what you're outsourcing in your time and expertise to other people. Uh, so although I would probably skip right to syndications. Um, I do appreciate the, the experience that I got by, by being a more active investor through turnkeys. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good point. I, I'm of the similar mindset. I, I would love to say that I wish I would have started with multifamily, but boy, I had some experiences and learned so much, learned about property management, learned what it was like to have partnerships with construction crews and dealing with property management and dealing with out of state. Um, you know, some of the challenges with the different municipalities and just understanding it is very, very different in other parts of the country than it is here in my backyard in Phoenix. So, yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah interesting. So, so it dawns on you after doing some education, probably some book reading and, and podcasts, podcasts university. I hear some people call it. I like that. Yeah, I was right. of the similar nature. Um, talk to me about that first deal, if you can. How did you find them? How did you vet it? Um, what was it like wiring those dollars the first time? That's always a scary, scary topic. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, you're right. Uh, for some reason, wiring money for a syndication seems a little bit more scary than wiring it for a down payment on a turnkey property. Yeah. At least it was for me. But uh, through Podcast University, um, I found heard about syndication. So I listened for a while and kind of, I mean, it just seemed, I've, I've got shiny object syndrome. Uh, so I kind of chased, chased the shiny, shiny object. And this was, I didn't, wasn't sure if this was just another one or what, but um, I think what I experienced is after listening to and learning about it, I saw an opportunity come up um, in March or April of 2018. And it was down in Phoenix. And I just, I had already decided at that point, you know, Scaling through turnkey properties just wasn't going to be the path that I continued down. Um, and so I, I did enough what I thought I did enough research to, to feel comfortable with the operator. Uh, I knew Phoenix. Uh, well, I didn't know that property. I knew Phoenix. And it just seemed like a perfect opportunity. And so kind of my philosophy is uh, not to get stuck in, in overanalyzing something. So uh, I try to get to 80% or 70% sure of something. And, and if, if the remaining uh, mystery isn't solved, uh, as long as I'm 70 or 80% confident and I've done what I can or what I feel I can do for due diligence, uh, then I feel comfortable. And uh, that property has since gone full cycle and the operator has proven themselves to be worthy. And 
uh, and I continue to invest with them. So I lucked out with that very first one, uh, but uh, but uh, I eventually went down to a meetup and found a, a friend who is now my business partner in Left Field Investors. Uh, and meeting someone else who was doing the same thing kind of took a little bit of the crazy off the table for what I was doing. And I thought, okay, someone else who's been down a similar path is, is investing with these guys in this type of real estate. And so uh, finding, a, finding a friend or a network uh, was, was helpful for me to get over that. What did I just do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think our wives or, or my wife certainly is happy when I find somebody else to talk about this stuff. Cause um, yeah, we talk about a lot in this household, probably more than she would care to. So that's funny. <laughs> <I hear you. laughs> yeah. All right. So you get that first deal. Um, fast forward, it goes full cycle, but then you mentioned shiny object syndrome and looking at your resume, if we, if we call it a resume of, um, I think you mentioned you are in 40 plus deals across 15 different operators. Talk to me about um, any type of strategies that you're leveraging. Um, you know, do you do you like certain asset classes more than others? How do you set up your portfolio? Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a preface. So through Jim Piper and Left Field Investors, we also met a partner called uh, Tribe Invest. And TribeVest, just real simply and quickly, is a platform that helps establish uh, an LLC through investing partners. So, for example, in the LLC that Jim and I formed, there's five of us. And so my, my, one of my investment philosophies is to diversify as much as possible by operator, by asset class, by geography. And so although I started by investing at minimums, in the deals that I got into, I knew that capital is, uh, is not unlimited. And so mm -hmm. although I had, had planned to deploy what I had, I knew that at, at some point in time, I still wanted to invest in deals, but I wasn't going to be able to get them, get in all of what I wanted by myself. So what TribeVest allowed us to do is to diversify and split the minimums in, in real estate syndications among, among what at that point in, with that group was five of us. So 40 sounds like a very large number uh, to, to a lot of people, but if you're splitting minimums uh, with, with five people, it becomes ma more manageable to diversify across the, those, those things that I said, the operator, asset class, geography, uh, and so forth. So um, that's diversification is really what, what we were trying to, what I was and what we were trying to achieve by, by going in at minimums and or splitting minimums. Yep, I, I, you are you are preaching to the choir, and that is that is what impact equity tries to provide as well: operator diversification, geography, um, even asset level. So if you're with one operator and it works really well, if you have multiple assets, I'd rather have twenty five grand in eight deals than put two hundred grand in one deal, just yeah. because there's always that outlier. That's yes, there's the outlier that's going to blow it out of the park and three extra money, but there's also that guy that. That might not do that as well. So, yeah. so this idea of tribe vest, and it's it's um, it's something I've taken a look at as well. I really like the benefits that diversification through a tool like tribe vest can provide um, for the the listeners that are not familiar with that in type of environment. I know you shared at a very high level, but are you talking, you know, minimum investments? Uh, are you talking individual deals that you could put five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in, or um, what are kind of the minimums when you start dealing with a group like TribeFest? Uh, so TribeFest itself is is the platform. It's it's a service for investors, so you can set it up in any way, shape, or form. So if there's a group of five people that want to invest um, in in anything, you, you get to set the minimums for what you're going to invest in probably one of the most important things for TribeVest is alignment within the membership. And so for, for the tribe that I invest most actively with, there's five of us uh, who are accredited investors and we have alignment in what we're going to invest in. So we will typically go in. So there, if there's a $25,000 minimum, we'll split that at $5,000 a piece. And so, uh, Getting into real estate syndication, typically the minimums are twenty-five or fifty thousand, and then we just split that among the five of us. And uh, we've we've had that group since for, since late nineteen or early twenty. And what's 
what's fun now is kind of the, to reap the harvest. And so we've had a couple of deals go full cycle. And so now we're redeploying and we're not putting more money into new deals. The, the, the returns are now starting to reinvest and redeploy for us. So that's kind of fun to see some of that stuff turn full cycle. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing, when they start going uh, full cycle and you reinvest, your monthly distributions get bigger and bigger every time, right? right. right. Yeah. Yep, yeah. So, so that's super exciting. It, it gives the traditional investor um, the ability to start investing in the space, kind of dip their toe in it without those hefty minimums of 25 or 50. And it, it seems like it could work really well with either some family members or maybe some buddies from work or even some community members, whatever that could be, yeah. just folks that are like-minded coming together to want to to investigate this path. So very good. Yeah. Thanks for for sharing that. Probably need to get those guys on the podcast as well to talk about it a little bit yeah. more, but yeah. Um, so let's dig in if we can about asset classes. I know, I know you're a big fan of multifamily, um, but what other kind of asset classes do you like? And what are some of the reasons why you chose to diversify around or outside of multifamily? Um, you're right. Multifamily is what we've invested the most with. And I think it's probably where most people start in syndications as well. And so um, one, one reason I've diversified is, you know, the, the market is the mar market has changed in the last couple of years, even since I've started investing. Um, so part of it is diversifying outside of the asset class. And the other part too is um, is just seeing other opportunities for diversification in in asset class and structure. And so, a couple of the things that we've done more recently um, are self storage. Uh, self storage is kind of a hedge against uh, what's going on in the economy. Uh, it seems to be uh, fairly economically or fairly uh, recession resistant. Uh, We've also done some investments with uh, triple net industrial, uh, which when you're in, in triple net, uh, you know, you, you've got a flat rent and all of your expenses are paid by the tenant. And so uh, in, in times of high inflation, your rents may not be keeping pace with inflation, but your expenses are, are, are uh, borne by the tenant. And so uh, you've, you've got a, a different way in an inflationary environment to, to, to get returns in those triple net spaces. So those are a couple of things that we've invested more heavily in outside of multifamily, uh, especially with our group. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of new things coming as operators start to diversify um, forward thinking in the economy. So uh, a okay. couple that have made some headlines are car washes. Car washes seem to be kind of a the cash flow king and and uh, and some of the that operators are trending for uh, toward so um, self storage office even uh, office mm -hmm. is not a favor asset class but presents some some buying opportunities especially if you're working with an operator who knows, knows the space and then uh, uh, triple net commercial and industrial uh, opportunities as well so among okay. others uh, we're I'm, I'm Really, industry and, and asset class agnostic now. Uh, so. Got it. Okay, so you're really just and you mentioned this. You're looking for a good operator, and if they're an expert in their field and they're scaling their business, that could be a good opportunity to invest in a syndication type model, right? Yeah, uh, the thing I've learned most uh, over the years as a, as an investor is operator first. Yeah. And then yeah. the deal second, uh, but far behind the operator. An operator is the most important thing in a deal. Um, there are other factors in there, but, but definitely operator first. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. Um, let's see here. I, I noticed too from your bio, you've done some short-term rental investing, some crypto investing. There was another one that I didn't understand what it was. Um, uh, let's see here. No, that was just industrial. So short-term rentals and crypto as well. So what's your experience been like with short-term rentals and crypto investing up to, uh, up to date anyways? Uh, too soon to report, I would say. Okay. Uh, so through, uh, to kind of go back to Tradvest, uh, through left field investors, we've networked with other investors who A, want to get into crypto. And so I, I wanted to get into crypto and didn't, did not have the expertise. So that's another area of the triangle I didn't have. And so there were enough people wanting to form a tribe that we invested in, in, a, in a crypto fund. 
And the, the same with short-term rental. Um, there's another tribe that I have. Uh, I'm in, I'm in a, a few of them now, but uh, that, that tribe was focused on just trying new operators, new asset classes, new things that we hadn't had experience with as a group. Mm. Uh, and so again, we're splitting the minimums among uh, amongst a larger group of people. And so, uh, number one, it's very recent, so I don't have uh, enough experience to tell you how it's going. But two, uh, it's a great way for for us in a like minded LLC to dip our toe in the water in those different asset classes. Yeah, very neat, very neat. So um, we we've referenced or you've referenced. Um, Left field investors a couple of times. Uh, I, I wanted to shift over into the education standpoint, and this seems like the perfect opportunity. So, tell me about this left field investors. This is uh, something I've been watching for quite some time. I'm, I'm a member as well now. Um, but yeah, tell the community if you can, or the listeners, what that community looks like. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, and, and also uh, thank you for being a member. We we appreciate that. Uh, Actually, going back earlier in our conversation, you asked about getting comfort with that first wire in a syndication. Uh, I didn't have that total comfort, although I, I, I made the investment. The, the next thing I did that fall is go to an investor meetup. And there I met Jim Piper, who is now a business partner of mine and left field investors. And we became, we became friends there and we followed up and had discussions about every two weeks and he was just a fellow investor that I could bounce ideas off and talk about yeah. stuff with. And one day we had a conversation and I said, you know what, it would have been nice if, if we had a community of people that were doing the same things, a network of people that were doing the same things. And he said, you know, uh, we tried to do something like that here in Columbus where he's based. And he said, we were just going to have a dinner club meeting. And that was in March of 2020. So the first meeting never actually happened. Wow. So, like everything else in, in uh, the COVID world, it became a Zoom uh, culture. And so he invited me to, to this thought process of forming a community of like-minded investors who just wanted to learn and grow and bring value to each other and, and educate each other uh, together. And so that's where Left Field Investors was born. It is just a community of like-minded individuals who are learning and investing and growing together and networking and, and learning more about the process so we can all get better together. I love it. Yeah, I what I what I've grown to love about this community is this idea of givers gain, pay it forward, abundance and just share with everybody. There's so many opportunities out there and education opportunities out there. So your organization is doing just a really, really great service for this space. So thank you guys for that. Um, yeah, I look forward to continuing to dig in more into that network as well. I've invested through the network and and received some pretty, pretty nice benefits by just associating with that group. So I would encourage listeners to to reach out and check them out. We'll we'll put that information in the, the show notes for sure. So, okay. so um, let's, if we can, um, you mentioned early on podcast. I know that Left Field Investors has a great podcast as well, but are there other podcasts that you're listening to regularly to stay on top of the trends and the markets and what's going on in the economy? Where do you get your um, educational content? Uh, back in my W2 days, I traveled a lot for work. So whether it was by plane or car, I had a lot of time staring at the back of, a, of an air, airplane seat or the windshield. And so I was a I was a podcast junkie for for all of that time. Now that I'm working remotely and, and working from home, I guess um, I don't listen to as many podcasts as I as I'd like to or used to. But um, you, you're right. I, I always listen to ours. <laughs> That's kind of a, a bias thing. But I always listen to ours, which is passive investing from left field. Um, but I love learning about new opportunities, like your new podcast. Um, one thing that I do. Uh, have to give credit to is uh, the Wealth Formula podcast. That's what introduced me to uh, to syndications. I still listen to that one. And uh, kind of like what you said too about communities just working together. We uh, investing is a zero sum game if we're all if we're all in it to do it together. And so uh, whether you're an a member of Left Field Investors or Bucks uh, Wealth Formula Network, um, that's another podcast I listen to. Um, I, I like Kathy Fetke's Real Estate News for Investors. That one's mm -hmm. kind of a quick and easy, almost like with your morning coffee type of thing. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the real estate guys are always very good. Um, and, and there are several others that I, that I listen to, but uh, not as much time in podcasts as I'd like to have usually committed to in years past. Okay, very good. So, so what's next? What's on the horizon for um, Ryan with Passive Investing? Are there um, bigger and more investments or different asset classes or what, what's getting you excited lately? Um, I, I love investing, uh, investing in new asset classes um, and with new operators. So that kind of scratches a little bit of my shiny object itch as well. So uh, I think looking forward in, in maybe a two to three year time horizon, my goal is to find the operators that I trust the most. And maybe that's a, you know, I, I think that might be a group of somewhere between two and 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, 10 sounds like a lot, but I also want to have a, a section of my portfolio that uh, is, is investing in new things that I don't feel a level of comfort yet. So that's new asset classes, new, uh, new operators, new opportunities, like a car wash, like land development, like crypto. I always want to have a, a portion of my portfolio that, that I can learn and explore while keeping the majority of it in, uh, in with operators and asset classes that I trust the most. Okay. Yeah, no, that seems to be a trend. It's, it's again, going back to that diversification model, but having a piece that you can kind of play with on the side. Syndication was kind of that small piece for me a handful of years ago. Um, and it's grown and grown and grown to where it's a very large percentage of, of my my total bucket now. So very neat. We're in alignment on that one for sure. So, well, why don't we do this? Um, I've got a couple of questions here just to wrap this up, but one that's kind of fun. What is a, a recent bucket list item that you've checked off the list? And what is a, a a bucket list item you hope to check off soon or are planning to? Yeah. So uh, recently uh, in June, my wife and I went on an anniversary cruise uh, to Greece uh, Montenegro, Italy, and Spain. So we wow. had never traveled overseas and it was uh, three times COVID postponed. Uh, so we finally got to go on that trip uh, in June of this year. And it was, it was everything we could have hoped it would, would have been. So that was a recent check off the bucket list for sure. Outstanding. My my wife and I are actually going to Spain on Monday um, ah, for our okay. second European trip, which we're just super excited about. So yeah, any, anything with Spain jump out to you that we got to check out while we're there? Uh, we were in Barcelona. It was the only okay. place in Spain we were. So uh, Barcelona was fantastic. Uh, we did a little GPS guided audio go-kart tour of the city. Oh, no kidding. Uh, which was amazing and if, if we had it anywhere in the states I'd, I'd love to go do something like that but barcelona was awesome and we actually have our furthest left field investor infielder uh over in barcelona so if you're in barcelona let me know and i'll connect you with billy yeah 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 that'd be great awesome all right any any future bucket list or next bucket list items you're shooting for uh well one other thing we have in common is phoenix and our, our back my background in phoenix i've always since I left, uh, I love living in Montana. It's where we'll always live, but I've always wanted to have a, a second or winter home in Phoenix. So I'm exploring the possibility of, uh, of short-term rentals so that I can cash flow a second home uh, that we can use as, as, a, as a vacation home as well. So that's, Beautiful. that's next on my investing and uh, investing bucket list and personal bucket list is to, to make that work as a cash flowing investment. Yeah. And how neat that you can align your personal goals and aspirations with your investment um, and bring the family and just get everybody involved. How how amazing is this real estate space? That's awesome. Yeah. Well, very good. So um, any any final thoughts for the audience you'd care to share? And um, where's, where's the best way for us to find you or for the um, audience to find you? Yeah, I think... Uh where I'm, where we're most active or where I'm most active is left field investors. Um, that is uh, the community we're building. And I always love to, to grow and network with other investors like you, like others that we've met through left field investors and anywhere else. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Ironically, I'm not the only Ryan Stig on LinkedIn, but if you find one that is connected as a co-founder with left field investors, um, that's that's the one i'm happy to connect i I love meeting and networking with other investors 
Fantastic. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show today. We learned just a, a ton about your journey and um, left field investors and just the many different strategies that you're using. You brought just a ton of value to the audience. Thank you so much. Um, and to the listeners, I would encourage you to connect with Ryan. I've learned just a ton from him. Definitely take a look at left field investors and listen to their podcast. Just fantastic content that really falls in alignment with what we're trying to do here at the, at the General Art of Crushing It. Just again, trying to inspire and educate that passive investor so they can pull the trigger on that first deal. Because once you do, I guarantee you, um, you'll be satisfied and you will come back to invest in many, many more. So um, Ryan, thank you again for joining us. And audience, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.